I wanted to investigate challenges and opportunities for local youth involvement in protected area management and governance in Brazilian Amazon. Um, well, in several rural areas around the world, two major processes of loss have occurred. Human populations have declined to, to, due to migration to urban areas, and uh, local knowledge and its transmission are vanishing, which we could call a uh, loss of traditional ecological knowledge. As these areas have been abandoned and cultural traditions lost, elders have had a hard time uh, engaging younger generations in learning <coughs> local languages and old traditions. And, and so uh, uh, they have seen uh, a greater disconnection with nature. Um, a major driver of this loss of ecological knowledge is the designation of protected areas on indigenous lands. Especially areas uh, aimed uh, at strict nature protection. So these areas have expelled not only indigenous communities from their ancient lands, but also non-indigenous populations, such as pastoralists, fishermen, and peasants. Hey, Marco, just we have, few, we have a few current, like on campus now, CLTL students who just got here. So why don't we let them situate? Because there's about there's four of them, and it, it would probably otherwise be distracting as you're trying to carry on. Um, All right, okay. So, yeah, just give it. Hi a few guys, seconds. how are you? How are you doing? <laughs> Sorry for being late. All right. Okay, we're good. Okay. Uh, Unlike these strict protection protected areas, there is a certain type of protected areas that have been more successful in uh, complying with their mission of promoting biodiversity conservation while having stronger support from local communities. These areas are people-oriented protected areas that I will call PAs. And, uh, under the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, protected area category system, these areas are category six, aimed to promote the sustainable use of natural resources. So these areas offer the opportunity to promote local livelihoods and biodiversity conservation in participative ways creating a sense of community identity and pride in local cultures, particularly by targeting younger generations. Uh, from a park manager's point of view, principles should um, underpin um, the engagement of local communities. Who, why, how, and when. So who might participate in PA management? What is the purpose of engagement? What forms of engagement and participation should be implemented? And what the timing and the frequency of engagement are? The first principle, who, is really, is really important and relevant when assessing the quality of governance in a PA because it relates to two other um, principles, legitimacy and voice. Youth is considered a vulnerable group, along, as, uh, along with indigenous peoples and women. And uh, the quality of governance in this situation is related to the degree of special support that is given to these groups to prevent discrimination. By being proper, properly empowered, community youth can play a fundamental role in PA management and biodiversity conservation. So in Brazil, in Brazilian protected areas, there is a general perception that youth 
have been disinterested in PA management and disconnected from it due to several factors. A lack of participation in the designation of protected areas where they live. Um, they do not have a real comprehension of the importance of the protected area. And they feel there's a lack of opportunities for their personal development and growth. For this reason, I was interested in investigating what is happening in a category six protected area in Brazilian Amazon, a reserve for sustainable development that I had visited previously. So my research aims in this capstone project were to determine the role played by local youth in current and future management and governance of uh, this protected area, to understand local youth attitudes and perceptions about the reserve and their future expectations living there. And finally, to inform policy towards increased youth participation in PA management and governance. Am I speaking too fast? No, no you're good. Perfect. Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Everything's perfect, Marco. <laughs> Great. So this is the site where I did my research, Rio Negro, which stands for Back River Sustainable Development Reserve. So um, it, it's located in the largest Amazon state. It's called Amazonas. And uh, it's a pretty small reserve by Amazon standards, 254,000 acres. There are 19 communities or villages there. Around 600 families live there and a total population of 2,500 people. Uh, the Rio Negro Reserve Mission, um, is, which is in its management plan that was published last year, is to guarantee the conservation of natural resources through sustainable activities, such as fishing, forest management, tourism, agroforestry systems, uh, promote income generation, the maintenance of traditional livelihoods, and increase in life quality for present and future generations. And the most interesting thing is that the reserve's vision that is in the management plan is to be a model of social cultural organization that involves the youth. So before I started my research, when I was preparing my research proposal, I didn't know the reserve had this vision in mind. So it's, I was really happy to learn that they that's their vision uh, for the future, to involve the youth based on the sustainable use of natural resources. So these are some pictures that I took there in the reserve. Um, I would like just to um, talk about this picture that is in the center on the bottom. You see a boat. So for the first time in my life, so I, I've, I've been to the Amazon many times, but I had never seen uh, a school boat before. So uh, many students have to commute to other villages by boat to study. So I, I found it really interesting. They have a school boat. Um, <laughs> you, see other, you, you see other pictures here. Uh, you see typical buildings that you find in their villages. Um, there's a festival here on the left corner uh, at the bottom. Uh, they have very beautiful river beaches there, so they have a lot, lots of uh, tourist potential. Uh, there are artisans uh, who live as well. And uh, the reserve has a deliberative a management board. There is a deliberative board with 27 members. 12 are non-governmental, 12 are, are governmental, and very recently, three new seats have been added to accommodate young members, young representatives, which is really interesting. The method, I, the research method that I cho cho chose uh, was focus groups. So I did 10 focus groups in 10 different villages. Um, 
groups ranged from four participants to 16 participants in these 10 different villages. The average number of participants was 7.8. The duration of each focus group, each focus group uh, ranged from uh, one hour, three minutes, one to one hour, 35 minutes. And I have used uh, these 11 questions as prompts to generate debate, discussion, and to generate the data I wanted. Uh, these focus groups were usually done in the community social center. So I had the circles. I had two recording devices and uh, I tried to moderate um, uh, without much interference and I tried to keep quiet most of the time, but sometimes it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> The analytical tool that I have chosen was thematic networks. Why thematic networks? Because they, it's a straightforward method that breaks up complex text, and long text into small chunks. It's easier to structure and see emerging themes in a graphic form, as well as understand how they relate to each other. And it also facilitates the communication of research results. So I've been through seven analytical steps. Step one, I devised a coding frame by breaking up text, resulting in codes or sub-themes, the, the rectangles in pink. Uh, step two, I identified and refined themes from the coded text segments which produced primary or basic themes, which are the, the rectangle white. In step three, I constructed the entire network, uh, which involved arranging and selecting basic themes, grouping them into organizing themes, and finally figure, figuring out which global theme would group all these organizing themes together. And just in step four, I started the real exploration of text by describing and exploring the In step five, I summarized the, res summarized the results. And finally, in step six, I related my findings to my original research questions and theoretical grounding. This, is, this table is just an example of the the code that I have um, identified, so it was 179 codes or sub-themes. Um, on the left-hand column, there, there are some examples of codes, so the raw data that, uh, that were in my trans transcriptions. And, the, um, and then, and then the, the, the right-hand column with the primary or basic themes. So this is a very long table. I'm not going to show you all, all of it. So just the first, first part. That's the final table with, the, with 17 basic themes organized into five organizing themes that produced my first global theme, how youth perceive the world. Then 15 more basic themes that, that were grouped into four organizing themes that produced my second global theme, Parkman. So that's the first thematic network. This first thematic network emerged from how youth perceived and which attitudes they had towards the community where they live, the reserve where they live, and uh, towards access to three basic human rights, access to work, healthcare, and education. And the rationale behind such approach is that the ways youth perceive one, social and environmental aspect in their villages and the reserve, and two, whether they have access to processes that promote human development both individually and collectively, might help understand how governance or leadership issues 
emerge and what concerns emerge among immunity youth. So I'm going to explore very briefly each of these organizing themes. The first one was organ uh, attitudes and perceptions about the community. So in each slide, on each slide, you will see a quote on the, on the, on the uh, right hand corner on the top, a quote that somehow was a, a, was a summary of, of the theme. And uh, in this case, there were more negative views than positive views about the, the community where, where youth live. So youth want to move. Most, most participants want to move because they believe they can only seek jobs in a city, they can only uh, get a college degree in a city, and they find it really hard to get healthcare in the village. They think the roads, the dirt roads that give access to their villages is a threat to their community life. It's not everyone who's really excited about living in, in the reserve. There is a certain lack of local interest in community development and leadership. They do not seem to understand the role played by elders in leadership. And most participants showed passive attitude towards the community, its problem and potential solution. They, they, it seems that they think solutions should be brought by someone else and that, and that they do not have a role to play in changing their own reality. However, there were participants who believed that uh, it was really positive to live in, in the community because they, they are free to move um, around safely. They can catch food in the forests and rivers. They have a good social life, a summer life as compared to city. And they want to stay because they believe they have a role to play as steward sorry, as future stewards of the land. And they, they think that they are, they, they are potential key players in terms of the future of the community and the reserve. I just want to, to show you this poster on the right side of the slide, which I found really interesting because I have seen this in Brazil, everywhere in Brazil. It, this is a poster announcing a, a local rural festival. And if you compare the poster, the characters in the poster, to the people I interview, you see that it's totally different in terms of physical traits. So you see this uh, blue-eyed and blonde girl, this white guy with light brown hair and, loud br and, and light brown eyes. So it's really interesting, maybe shocking to observe that they picture themselves as someone totally different from who they really are. Um, part of it, I believe it's the influence of TV shows, TV soap operas. So I think there is here an issue in terms of local identity or belonging to a local culture and pride in local culture. I'm going to talk about this later. The second organizing theme, um, Attitudes and, attitudes and perceptions about the reserve, there were uh, some more positive views than negative views. Uh, they, they believe, well, they have positive values towards nature. They think the reserve is beneficial to them because it protects, protects them, safeguards the environment and the natural resources on which their livelihoods depend. And so they think the right attitude is, is to protect forest rivers. They think there's a much better air quality where they live. They see clearly the value of the Amazon forest. They, they said that the Amazon forest is the world's lungs. They believe the reserve is important to their social life because they know everybody in the reserve. They feel safer there. And many participants want to start their own business in the reserve and they think they should bring solutions to their problems such as deforestation access to school and healthcare. there were some negative views so uh, uh, 
some participants think their neighbors have uh, um, environment behavior, environmental behaviors that are detrimental to the reserve. And uh, they believe the reserve is harmful since it was created. They think it hasn't really brought any um, economic and social progress for them. Organizing theme three, access to education. So there has, there is some evidence in the literature that there is a correlation between education and learning and the development of leadership skills or critical thinking. Um, so in Rio Negro Reserve, there are there, there, is all, there are all sorts of barriers to go to school. I showed you that, um, that school boat, so many students have to commute to other villages to study. And I'll tell you, it's really tough to, uh, to take a boat on Rio Negro, on, on Negro River. You know, it's a very wide river, very rough waters. It's very scary, really. And many students go to school at night. So I find it really, really tough. Uh, so they, they have all sorts of problems. So lack of fuel for the boats, lack of pilots. Sometimes there, there's no school lunch. Um, and they believe education has a major transformative role for them. It's not every community that has schools. And, and none community has a college institution. So if they want to study, if they want to get a college degree, they have to, to go to a city, to the nearest town. So many participants quit studying after high school. Um, and, um, and, the only, and the only choice they, they perceive they have is to follow a teaching career. So we study pedagogy because there are local schools and, and it's the only sort of job they, they perceive they would, would be able to, to get. Uh, they mentioned some solutions to the educational problem, like distance education, but especially to bring a college institution to the reserve. I, I have interviewed uh, uh, youth who were able to have access to education, and it has really brought some valuable opportunities for them develop leadership skills and promote environmental awareness in their communities. The last thing for is access to health care. So there are also evidence in the literature about the link between physical and mental well-being and the capacity to lead and perform well in a leading position. But in the reserve, in the communities, there is a great, a, a serious lack of health centers. Um, and even when there is a, a local health center, there are no medical professionals all the time, no medical technicians, equipment, or medicine. So the only choice sick residents have is to commute to the, the nearest village to see if, if there is a health center with medical professionals. Or even worse, they have to commute to go to the nearest town. But then if, if we imagine it's an emergency situation, then it's really, really complicated to take a boat and, and very quickly have to go to a hospital in the nearest town. That's the last organizing theme in this uh, network, access to work. So many participants feel there are no job opportunities in their villages. The only kind of job they have is odd jobs, which is usually heavy manual labor. So the only way out for them is to seek job in a city. Um, as I said, the only uh, kind of job they, they, they perceive they should pursue is a teaching career. Uh, but many, many participants uh, have the intention to stay and work in the villages because they feel there are potential opportunities for them to work, especially in tourism. But they also understand 
that building local capacity is key. Be better prepared to work in the future. Uh, just one thing. Uh, so in this picture here, you see a local man feeding a river dolphin. Uh, so in tourism, there are potential jobs for them. This is a, a floating lodge that I have visited. Uh, tourists go there to, to see the, this wonderful mammal. And uh, so it was interesting to see this kind of work. My second, the second global theme that I will explore with you guys is park management. So there are four organizing themes I'd like to talk to you about. The first one, mechanisms, rules, and stakeho stakeholders related to park management. Uh, most participants or, or few participants have the exact notion of how important the reserve is for their livelihoods. Um, few have or few perceive that, that they could have a role to play in park management, and few have a clear understanding of the reserve's mission. Most youth do not, do not have a clue about management rules, who has the right to use local resources, and what the management board is, for example. They do not know that there are youth in their villages who promote environmental awareness and who are members of the management board. Uh, they believe the, the reserve is failing its mission to promote social development and, environment, and sustainable environmental use. And they uh, find it really important that there is a local NGO called the Sustainable Amazon Foundation, or FAS, F-A-S, uh, that promotes um, um, local development and, uh, and is key to community projects. Participation is the second organizing theme. So it's a, an important issue because it's the foundation of a sustainable development reserve. As I showed you before, the vision of the reserve is to uh, expressed in the management plan is youth participation. So youth perceive they should have a more participative role in community life and PA management and, and uh, park management. Um, they want more opportunities to participate in, in park management. Uh, as I said, there are three young members in the management board, but it's really hard to involve youth in community politics and organization. Just, just to give an example, the, the people that I interviewed told me they had never got together, as we did in our focus groups, to talk about problems, about local problems, about local solutions. They said, it's the first time we, we got together to talk in, in a group. So I was really, really shocked. Um, and uh, they, they, they say adults do not trust youth. They say adults say youth do not have the capacity or skills to do some, anything serious. But at the same time, I talk to some adults and they say youth are not really interested and miss several unique opportunities in, in participating in art management. Uh, there was a landmark in 2014 uh, when the program where I work in the Ministry of the Environment supported a project called the The Young Protagonists Project. So this project was really important to build youth leadership and youth capacity in Rio Negro Reserve. The project uh, uh, held nine workshops covering several themes such as participative management, biodiversity conservation, cooperatives and associations. Between 40 and 70 um, youth people attended each workshop and uh, uh, participants, participants told me that the project was really decisive and very a positive effect on those who, who attended the, the workshops. It has motivated youth 
to attend more community meetings and even join um, the, the local community association. Leadership. So you believe that new community leaders will uh, rise among themselves because they have this perception that old, lead, old leaders are aging and, and, and therefore they will have somehow to take over their responsibilities. And in order to do that, youth uh, know that they will have to know the proper skills and knowledge from the, the elders. So getting involved now is a crucial step if they want to, to become future leaders. Organizing theme three, communication. So there, there are serious internal and external communication gaps in the reserve. So uh, youth, first of all, complain that they never talk to each other, even in their villages. They never talk to neighbors. And um, so they never learn what's happening in their, in their villages. For example, they said, well, the community president never comes to us and explain what's happening, what meetings are going to happen. They also complained that the young members of the management board never comes to them and explains what was discussed in the previous management board meeting. Um, and, uh, and the reserve is a pretty isolated place. There's no internet signal, no telephone signal, apart from one community where the internet signal is very weak. So, so every, every participant said, we want internet, we want to have access to the outside world. Um, so they think the lack of means of communication is, is a huge barrier uh, uh, to their development. And the economic sector, they believe, severely affected by the impossibility to communicate is tourism because they cannot advertise, they cannot attract tourists, and they cannot uh, really uh, uh, sell their handicrafts. And that's the last uh, organizing theme in this global theme, entrepreneurship. So many youth want to start their own business and become self-employed. But apart from extracting wood or timber, youth do not perceive that they do not have a real perception of which forest, forest products or services they would be able to extract and, uh, and maybe start their, their own business. Um, almost every village has a community-based forest management plan. But these plans are not really working very well. Uh, youth claimed that forest management takes too long it's too bureaucratic and, and they live too far away from potential buyers, which makes the final price of timber too high. And then it scares potential buyers who uh, prefer to go for illegal markets of non-certified wood. So the only other major uh, supply chain they perceive as worth investing in is tourism. They believe tourism is underdeveloped and therefore it, it has lots of potential um, uh, in, in, their, in their villages. Another uh, important um, activity is uh, the making of handicraft, which they believe um, adds value to a community visit and also raise important gender equality issues because it's mainly women who are art, uh, artisans um, and they believe tourism can only succeed if there are partners who would be willing to invest in, in their communities. Well, now it's a step, uh, I'm, I am in, uh, in step five, so I will kind of summarize the thematic networks by presenting themes that have emerged from the networks that somehow 
influence youth life and choices that might determine their chances of playing decisive roles in their communities and as potential or emerging leaders in park management and governance. First one, belonging and identity. So there were mixed perceptions about their communities, about their attitudes towards the communities. So some suggest that they have the potential to become future community leaders, but developing a community identity is not as straightforward as we would believe. Uh, many participants have a total lack of interest in community issues. So there is here a, a, an issue uh, in terms of um, developing a sense of community identity and, and, and pride in local cultures. Protection, so the, uh, the, they feel the reserve protects their lives and that they, uh, in their turn, should also protect the reserve. And such protection, they believe, is assured by their knowledge and their ideas to promote local development. But conversely, the reserve is also for them a threat because they believe it offers no perceived, op perceived opportunities of any kind for many participants. There is a, a legacy effect that has emerged as a theme because uh, participants said that they have a hard, a tough life today because their parents didn't have a chance to go to school. And because of that, they have to persevere. So they, the community life is really tough. So everything, I, I found everything really tough there. The climate is very tough. Going to college is very tough. Having access to healthcare is very tough. So, um, and in terms of education, the first choice, the first choice of a college degree they, 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 they have or they perceive is rarely available. So they, it, it seems to them they are never able, they will never be able to uh, pursue their dream careers. First, because they cannot afford going to a city to study and because they think what they want to study uh, won't, give the, won't give them a job in their villages. So it seemed to me they, they lost the control of this crucial decision in their lives. Um, so the risk of getting sick is a daily challenge they face, not only youth, but also children, adults, and elders. Um, so their future is particularly dependent on work choices they have. So if they want to, to work locally, um, or uh, sorry, if they cannot work locally, the decision to abandon their villages where they were raised to seek jobs in a city is a very tough uh, uh, decision. And if they want to participate in park management, and local governance, they have to stay in the villages, but they will only stay if they find or if they perceive there are real work opportunities. Partnerships, so partnerships, they think they are really important to create jobs and generate income. Their comprehension of uh, management mechanisms, institutions, stakeholders is very limited. So if they, if they do not have a real comprehension, if they, not, if they do not understand how their territory is governed, so it would be hard for them to, to play any decisive roles in the future in terms of park management. So it's important that they, that they believe it's important that they have, that they are proactive. So this is key to increase their participation, park management, and local governance. But as I, as, as I mentioned before, there are youth who are not interested in any of these issues. And oh, sorry, connection. So connection, 
as I have just mentioned, is a crucial theme. So local youth want to connect to their neighbors and especially to the outside world. They see communication as a very important tool to promote development, generate income, and expand their minds. And finally, vision. So there are youth who have the vision of communities that invest in their own businesses, and by doing so, attract partners, create jobs, generate income, and promote local development. So that's my that's the last step interpreting pattern. So I, I want to relate uh, the themes and patterns that emerged in the analysis to my original research question, especially my major question. So which role do local youth play in the current and future management and governance of Rio Negro Reserve? So th these four themes that emerged are somehow a synthesis of all these analysis. They represent extraordinary challenges to youth participation in park management and governance. So pride, which has to do with what I've mentioned before, their own identity, their sense of community identity and belonging to their communities. So this is, this is a very mixed perception, which is a cause of concern get them more involved in community life and future park management. Vulnerability. So youth, local youth are extremely vulnerable. They are in, a, in an extremely vulnerable position. A major threat is that they are totally vulnerable to diseases. So I have seen sick people there. I have seen sick children, sick youth, sick elders. Uh, and uh, so th that probably will affect their mental and physical abilities to work, to study, and ultimately influence their decision to stay in the communities, raise their children there, and participate in park management and community politics. The third um, major theme, there is a summary of this analysis, is connection. So youth want to connect to the rest of the world. They feel this is really important for them to not to, 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 to become so isolated as they feel now. And finally, knowledge. So youth will hardly be able to play any role, any significant role in park management in the future if they do not comprehend, for example, what community participation entails and what the management rules are. In other words, the lack of knowledge is a major barrier to youth's involvement in local governance. So my conclusion is that the role played by youth in park management and governance today is very low. This is a result of one, a lack of identity with the territory and the culture where you live. Two, vulnerability to the consequences of a lack of access, not only to healthcare, but also to jobs and educational opportunity, which hinder their, their involvement in park management and local governance. And three, a lack of understanding about park management rules, limitations, and opportunities. So I'd like very briefly to make some recommendations to tackle the, this, this, this issue of low youth involvement in park management. So I believe there should be more capacity building and leadership building for youth. It's very important for me that youth participate in uh, devising and implementing local community action plans that brings more youth to participate in park management. I'm sure that new young protagonists modules should be held because it was an important landmark in terms of building local leadership. 
Um, the local NGO that I talked about, FAS, is a very strategic pattern because they have been working in the reserve for many years now. So I think a stronger cooperation should exist with the local NGO. Uh, there should be a better communication among youth, among them and their neighbors, and also among youth and park management. Um, and also with the, with the management board. Um, so the forest management plans are in almost in each community, but it's really underdeveloped. So I think it's really important to strengthen, strengthen these plans because they are a, a potential source of um, and local work. And finally, the park should have a, a stronger engine. Uh, my, my friend Pablo is the park manager, but he uh, most of the time works on his own. I think it's really important that the government um, uh, hires uh, more personnel, at least three more full-time personnel to help the park manager do his job. And I just want to finish by uh, talking about two research limitations that I had, time and communication. So I, if I could, I would have spent much more time with uh, villagers before I started my research project. I think I would have got along better with community residents, socialized and gained their trust. So I should have arrived, I don't know, five or six weeks in advance. Um, sometimes it was really hard to communicate to locals the purpose of my research. And because it was the first time I did focus groups, so sometimes it was hard to communicate with, with my participants. And, uh, and my, but my biggest limitation was time. Um, I, in fact, I did nine semi-structured interviews with the park manager, members of the management board, youth participants of the, in the Young Protagonists project, but I didn't have the time to transcribe all this data, which was like nine more hours of data. And I even did an additional focus group on the last day with the um, with the with, with management board me. So I believe I, I still have very rich data to be transcribed and analyzed, but I would have needed two or three more months to finish. So I decided to focus on my on my my data analysis, on my youth focus groups. So these are my references, so lots of references. And before I end, I wish to express my deepest gratitude to some people and institutions. So I'm grateful to all young uh, men and women from Unig Reserve who are the heart and soul of this research. My dearest CLTL friends, so you were my inspiration and motivation all the time I spent in Colorado. My CLTL instructors were great. I really thank, thank them for everything they, they, they taught me. Pablo and Anna were my friends in Amazonas. They were my hosts there. They gave me great support. Uh, Brett and Tara, I thank you so very much for your guidance and support. Rebecca and Stacy, thank you for being part of my committee and for your classes. I want to thank some institutions, Ministry of the Environment of Brazil and Chico Mendes Institute of Biodiversity Conservation. They were great supporters of research. The Amazonas Secretariat of the Environment allowed me to do my research in Unigo Reserve. And I want to, to thank CSU and the Organization of American States. They were really important in my life because they awarded me three scholarships that helped me pay my tuition fees and, and live in, in Fort Collins. 
And finally, the American people were very generous while my family stayed in the United States. <laughs> and the Brazilian people who, who paid my, my salary while I was on a paid leave in, um, in the USA. And I just want to say a last thing that I am and will always be 100% Ram proud. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marco.